My scripture this morning is found in the book of Acts, chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. Now there in the church that was in Antioch, certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted the Holy Ghost, said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia. And from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also John to their minister. And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was the with the deputy of the countries, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him, and said, O full of, o full of all subtly and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season, and immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness. And he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, which, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, we open up this scripture with the church of Antioch. And in this church, there were certain prophets and teachers, such as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, which was Latin for black. And the Wycliffe Bible commentary is believed that he was called this because of his dark complexion and suggests that he was from African origin. It's also just suggested that this man was also Simon of Serene, the man that was called, to, called on to carry the cross of Jesus Christ. Mentioned in Mark 15, 21. And you know, I think it's a testament to how much a person could, can grow after a true meeting with Jesus Christ and His Holy Spirit. Even though a brief moment in time, he was transformed by that encounter to be now listed as a prophet of God. There was also a prophet by the name of Manan, who may have been a foster brother of King Herod, and he grew up with the royal family. And then there was Saul, whom we know as Paul. It was during the church service that these great men of God, that the Holy Spirit began to work among them. And through their devoted time in prayer and in fasting, and through inter interpretations of tongues, the Holy Spirit called upon Paul and Barnabas to be the first missionaries to target the Gentile population. Because these men were especially gifted in word and in spirit, the men of the church of Antioch, they laid their hands upon 
Paul and Barnabas, and they sent them forth as delegates of the church of Antioch. You know, Paul and Barnabas, they were filled with the Holy Ghost, and it says that they preached at every synagogue they came to. And as they preached, they also had John Mark with them, or Mark with them, to help minister to the new converts. He was also the cousin of Barnabas. And he did a good job helping Paul and Barnabas teaching about Christ. But we read later in verse 13 how he was not quite ready to do full-time ministry in the Lord. Not at that time. And anyone in full-time ministry will tell you there's no picnic. There's no bed of roses at times. It takes commitment. But he leaves him at this time on the, at the Isle of Patmos and to later return that we read in the scriptures to come back to Paul and become very necessary with Paul. We also know that he later on wrote the book of Mark that has inspired us all from time to time. What a church it must have been at the city of Antioch to produce such God-inspiring men such an inspiration to all of us. You know, as Paul and Barnabas, they were, they were ministering to the synagogues, they ran across a fellow that was a sorcerer, a false prophet, and a Jew, it says. In today's terms, he would just be considered a magician, making people believe that he had powers. His name was Bar-Jesus. Or sometimes he went by the name of Elimus. The man was employed by the Roman proconsul. The Bible said calls him the deputy of the country. His name was Sergius Paulus. And Barnabas caught the attention of Paulus, and, and he gave permission to them to speak to a larger audience. You know, I never really thought much about it before. But I guess the reasons why so many leaders would allow religious people to come into their midst and to you know, give them audience to speak and such was to find out new things. You know, here they are in, in our day, we have TVs and radios and all this stuff to entertain us. They didn't. So they got entertained by people coming in, new speakers. New religious ideas, new inventions of the day. You know, to help them be entertained or inspired to, to grow personally. So Paulus, he must have heard some of the preaching of Paul or, or maybe he overheard rumors of how well they were being received among his people. So he wanted to hear what they had to say. So he sent word and he gave permission for for Paul to speak to a large audience and of course Paul and Barnabas they wasn't going to turn it down that's what they were there for but now when Bar Jesus got word of this he didn't like it at all he knew that if his Paulus the Roman proconsul was to accept the Christian faith that his image of being an all powerful sorcerer was going to fall apart. So Bar Jesus, he was determined in himself to undermine the ministry of Paul and Barnabas. And he tried to keep his boss Paulus from ever hearing the words about Jesus. Now the scripture doesn't tell us exactly how it was that Elimus was what he was saying or doing. It just says that he was trying his best to stop his boss, Paulus, from hearing or believing the gospel of Christ. Elimus was distracting Paulus so they could not focus on the message of Christ. Much like many of the things today are just trying to distract us from the true message of the gospel. Even the message of love and, 
in humanity. Think about it for a moment. During this pandemic, with all the social distancing and job layoffs and food shortages, empty shelves, our stores look like something out of a third world country. And they still have it recovered. You go into a store now and you see empty shelves everywhere. People having to stand in line to buy food or get food. But we as a nation, we started pulling together. There were many people and companies and churches and social organizations, they started meeting the needs of the people. Supplying what others needed instead of hoarding it. Our news full of COVID-19 and death were also filled with others helping. Humanity had its finest. The kind of things that we wish we could always see when we turned on the news. And should see. People were even sharing their stockpiles of toilet paper. Hey. <laughs> People were loving and sharing the good side of humanity. And then out of nowhere it seemed it's like someone just pulled a switch. And our lives and our television screens were filled with hate and violence. Murder and looting and a division that Seems like it will never heal. Too many people have replaced that caring and sharing for hate. We can't look to the media to show the good in people. Not now. Because they're sitting around with their microphones and their cameras like a bunch of vultures waiting on someone to get hurt or someone to die so they can devour their carcasses. Bad news and death and destruction captures the attention of people more so than the good side of humanity. So once again, Satan uses distractions to take away from the good in mankind. The goodness and love that comes from God and God-fearing people. How many times in our own personal lives have we been distracted from hearing God speak to us. We hear him speak to our hearts and urging us to spend time with him. Maybe just a whisper at first. You know you need to pray. Or a thought. A memory like a reminder. Remember reading that story in the Bible about David and Goliath? Remember that story about Jonah and the whale? Or how about Noah and all those animals? Wouldn't it be good to read that story again? Just reread those stories. But then we push those feelings down. We throw them aside for a time to play a new game or read another book, a romantic novel, <laughs> or a cooking book. Maybe we push those feelings aside by being distracted by watching a new movie or a new show on TV. But we find everything in the world to distract us, ourselves, from listening to what God is trying to tell us. Maybe we just choose to go play sports or hang out with other people doing other things like eating movies or just running our mouths. And never giving the proper time to Jesus Christ. In prayer, in reading our Bibles, we're just talking about His goodness to one another and witnessing. We are allowing the elements of this world to distract us, just like the one back in Paul's day. Now, Paul was preaching the word to Christ and trying to reach all that was listening to him on that day. You're sharing the gospel and proclaiming to them that. Jesus is the only way to salvation of their souls. All the while, Elymas was distracting his boss, Paulus. He was trying to prevent him from accepting Jesus Christ as his Savior. Now this is where it takes a devoted Christian man or a woman of God 
that has spent time in prayer and fasting and is dedicated to serving the living God. It took this type of Christian to see and discern that Elias was allowing Satan, that old devil, to keep Paulus from fully understanding what the message of Christ's salvation was all about. The Bible tells us that Paul, being filled with the Holy, the power of the Holy Ghost, he does not play with the with the power that was held sway over Elias. That he looked at him, and I love the way the King James puts it. It says he set his eyes on him. You know that look. That kind of look that your mama used to give you when you were acted up and you was about to get a whooping. Y'all remember that look? <laughs> Boy, I do. She's been gone since 1998, but I still remember that look. But Paul looks at Elimus and he said very sternly and he calls him a child of the devil, an enemy of all unrighteousness. And he asked him, we not ever cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord. Paul knew Elymas was allowing the old devil himself to use him. And Paul was calling him out. He had had enough. Because the Elymas was allowing the devil to use him to prevent the gospel of Christ being preached on that day, he would pay the price. Paul tells him that the hand of the Lord was upon him. Now he would be blind for a season. Not being able to see the, the sun, only darkness for a time. And then Elymas went searching for someone to lead him home by the hand. There is a punishment for anyone that does not accept the Lord as Savior, and it is death. For the wages of sin is death. It doesn't matter how good you are, or how much good you do. If you're not born again, you will die in your sins and spend eternity in torment. You don't believe? You say God is love. And he wouldn't do that. Then read 2 Thessalonians 1.8. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That sounds pretty plain and stern to me. Satan and Elymas both lost that battle over the soul of, soul of Paulus because witnessing the power of God inflicting blindness on Elymas he was convinced. Paulus was convinced that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and that he wanted to accept Him and believe in Jesus as his Savior on that day. I like what the Bible says in verse 12. It says, Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed. Just a kicker, y'all. He saw the power of God. And then the verse goes on to say that being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. You know, there's so many times when we Christians were reading our Bible that we run across something new and it moves us. But think about someone hearing the gospel of Christ for the very first time and being astonished. Eyes finally open, mind-blowing truth. Pouring in the heart, life-changing message from God Almighty Himself. Hallelujah. Amen. And God's still doing that today, church. Paul knew about such an experience when he was blinded by the glory of Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. His eyes were blinded for three days until his conversion from Christian killer to Christian preacher after his encounter with Christ. And church, Jesus Christ is still opening the eyes and the hearts and the minds of anyone that will listen to the gospel today. But Satan is still out there 
trying to distract those that we love and care about. You know, I remember a time when I was witnessing to a young friend of mine. And I was telling him that if he didn't choose to live for Jesus Christ, he has already made his decision. And another friend of mine jumped in and he said, no, he has not. I said, yes, he has. If a person is trying to live for themselves, they have already chosen Satan. You're either living for Christ or you're living for Satan. There's no way in between. I want you to know, three weeks later, he called me and he said, he accepted the Lord, regardless of this other fellow jumping in and chiming in with something that he didn't know what he was talking about. I like the story that my son Adam told me the other day. He said that there was a field that was divided by a fence. And the Lord said, anybody that believes in me, you get on the right side of the fence. And Satan said likewise. Anybody that wants to follow me, you get on the left side. We'll have a party. But there were some people that didn't want to make the choice between them. So they got on the fence. So then it finally came time that the Lord said, okay, all my people, I'm ready to take you home. Let's go. So all these people started leaving and a few of the people on the fence jumped off. They went too. There were still some that stayed on the fence. And Satan came along and he took all his people. And you know where they went. But then those other people were still sitting there on that fence. And a little while later, Satan comes up. He says, okay, the rest of you get off the fence and come with me. And they're saying, no, we didn't choose to go on your side. He says, nope. That's my fence. So you're going with me. It's the same thing. You either choose Christ or you don't. The only way to the Father is through the Son. Not choosing is making a choice. The wrong choice. Satan, he's out there distracting people that God is preparing to meet, to meet you in store, in a restaurant, at work. We never know where God is sending them in our way. But the question is, are you going to be prepared to stop Satan as he tries to distract them? Or even you? When the opportunity arises to witness to them, will you be ready? Have you been spending enough time in God's Holy Spirit in prayer, study, and fasting so that you can discern when Satan is trying to distract you from the message of God at that moment? Or will you allow Satan to conquer another moment that could change someone's life for eternity? We're not talking about only helping people in a moment because a decision for to follow Christ and accept Him as their Lord and Savior is an eternal decision. And it doesn't need to be taken lightly. Just think of it. God is preparing each one of us to be His ambassadors. As His children. To lead others into His heavenly family a part of the family of God. We probably won't have to blind someone with the power of the Holy Spirit, but most likely we will have to turn off that radio, turn off that TV, and just speak the words of love and truth to someone, provided by the God's Holy Spirit that can make eternal changes in someone's life. You know, God may not be using you to lead them to Christ, but maybe at that moment just speak the words of God's wisdom to a time of crisis in their life, giving them a renewed hope and strength to face another day. 
The message that we have learned from this scripture today is this. Satan is doing all he can to prevent the love and wisdom of God to help and lead others to him as a source of life and liberty, as their Savior and Lord. And I'm telling you, church, wake up. And know this, beyond any shadow of a doubt, that Satan is trying to distract people of today about his coming back to redeem his church. His church full of people that worship him in spirit and in truth. And those that seek to live a life that is pleasing to God. Don't be distracted by what's going on around you. And live every moment watching and waiting for our redemption draw at night. You'll find that in Luke 21, 28. Amen. Amen.